So this is, uh, uh, I work at um, uh, the um, Intel's uh, uh, corporate headquarters in Santa Clara, and I just wanted to tell you about our uh, registration portal we use for non-IT access points as part of our uh, road containment system. Um, so for the past uh, 10 years, I've been chasing uh, rogue access points, and uh, we've had uh, that uh, it's, and so this uh, system has uh, uh, passed multiple security reviews. It's had, um, uh, so this system kind of incorporates the latest, um, um, <clears throat> you know, those, those learnings. And so this is, um, this is actually an internally developed application. And it's, um, you know, we have everything on a six month uh, review cycle. So all the different uh, agreements are, uh, uh, have the latest, meet the requirements. Oops. So you might say, well, why is something like this needed? Um, we actually do have a, uh, a kind of a IT provided lab over wireless environment where what we do is um, we, uh, they'll connect to a lab SSID and then based upon a uh, AAA override, we'll then um, switch a user to a particular lab interface. But um, IT has a lot, uh, Intel has a lot of, um, uh, uh, wireless enabled products and so we have different types of specialized needs and so it's uh, I mean they, people might, might want to connect to um, you know a particular uh, change their SSIDs change their channels uh, the they may have to they want to frequently change uh, device models uh, we need to assimilate different types of home environments and um, as part of their testing or just they just want to have uh, uh, unfettered you know, uh, unlimited external access. So, um, I mean, why is something like this useful? Well, um, if you have, um, you know, I mean, it's useful for troubleshooting, come more, more things about that later. Also, uh, it's useful for something like for, uh, for cyber events, where, you, you know, you can, and talk more about that later, and also just to educate users about good wireless practices, so if they have to connect if they have to use an IT device, then explain to them why channel three is a bad idea, you know, things like that. <laughs> uh, here's a, a general overview of uh, how this works. We have our uh, wireless access point management system, and um, once the device is fully approved, uh, a whitelist entry is uploaded into the rogue detection system. And uh, then if something is detected over wireless, which is not on the whitelist, then it's a rogue. And the wireless rogue MAC address is then uploaded, is then uh, sent to the uh, rogue enforcement tool. And simultaneously, we have a, um, a di we, the distribution routers are gathering the wired MAC address. And so if we have a device which is active, then what we, uh, then that's uh, a rogue, and then what we have is uh, rogue enforcement actions happen. Uh, ports can be shut down, tickets can be generated, and uh, also, uh, importantly, uh, a violator database is updated. Uh, here's, an, here's the example uh, logon screen of what this looks like. And I guess the thing to kind of mention here is towards the top, uh, we do have a thing saying uh, that we prefer that you use the, what we, what we call WIES, Lab of Wireless, Wire which is an IT provided solution. So we say you should really be going there, but if you want to request that, uh, something other than that, because it doesn't quite meet your needs, then there's two general steps. There's create an agreement and register your access points underneath it. And then towards the bottom in the, the red, bottom red box, um, it's just basically saying that um, it's a warning to follow the process because if you don't follow the process, there will be uh, consequences. Here's uh, one of the wiki entries that I had uh, that I created. And so it's just kind of showing the flow. So first you uh, request an agreement then you add uh, a uh, access point underneath the agreement. 
then you add the radios underneath that, under the access point, and then it goes to evaluation. I guess I should mention, and then there should say that there's also uh, email throughout the process, both of the requesters and the approvers. Uh, I guess a couple of learnings from this was in the earlier versions, um, we w used to have uh, people who would register these agreements and then they would you know, leave the company, maybe they'd be a contract worker or somebody. And then we would have orphan agreements. So the newer version of this, the, the one that we currently have, if somebody leaves the company, then what happens is they, uh, the, the access point is then uh, transferred to their manager. And so we have uh, accountability and updates for this because, for example, if the person's manager doesn't sign, then what happens is they, um, the, the, uh, an email will go out to their manager and if they don't respond, it'll go out to the manager above. And so there are emails to remind people about, uh, you know, that they need to, to check and either accept or reject the, the request. These are just some of the wiki instructions for the requester. So, uh, of course, people do all kinds of interesting things when they, when they bring in an access point. You know, I, I, th I had to, I had different people using, trying to use 40 megahertz channels on 2.4, so <laughs> time, so I added a wiki entry saying, don't do that, you know, it uses up two thirds of the 2.4 spectrum. And um, there were some other things where, uh, for example, people would bring in from access points from outside the, the US and they'd be using, say, channel 13. So I had some entries about that saying not to do this. But basically, it's just basically good wireless practices. So in the wiki entry for that. Uh, let's see. This was just the kind of the initial part of the creation process <clears throat> where you just create an agreement. You say where you're, uh, give the name of the agreement. Justification is just a brief description of the, uh, the lab and the, then some general uh, location information, the campus, the building, what uh, uh, division you're working in. After that, you register an access point and you record the, uh, the campus, the building, and actually, it's important, uh, worth pointing out here, the thing about the make, the model, and the version. So if you have a cyber event, then we can quickly pull up the database. You know, we've, we ha when we had our crack event, this is something that we pulled up and we looked at the, uh, the make, the model, and the version of all the different access points, which were not IT, to see which ones needed attention. Uh, another thing worth mentioning here is that towards the bottom, there's a thing with the network connection, which uh, there's a more detailed entry about that on the uh, next slide here. Um, so one of the things, of course, there was a question about, you know, is a device, if it's, is it even connected to a wire connection? And I can't count the number of times people would say to me, well, gee, do we have to register our access point? Because it will never, ever, ever be connected to wired. And, you know, they, they were. You know, I mean, there were people who would say, oh, yeah, I just have to do a real quick connection to, um, to upload some software or do something or other. And they'll plug it into the office network to do their real quick connection. And so, uh, and maybe the security is wide open or they'll do something. So it's good to have this MAC address information. Also, um, of course, we had the other entries here. Just wanted to know what it is. Is it restricted? Maybe it's some sort of non-router network. Maybe it's something isolated where it's just a direct connection to the server, or maybe it's just an externally facing data line, which is uh, less of a risk, at least to the overall IT, but maybe um, you know, to their lab. After that, uh, we register the uh, particular uh, access point under radio details. And we just have some things about the SSID and the Mac. Uh, we did have some things in here. Uh, and of course, we have some things saying, you know, you, uh, like for example, WPA2, you're turning it on, right? And um, so and I, I guess we're gonna have to update this to say WPA3. <laughs> but um, if some people say, no, I can't turn it on because I'm doing a test or, um, you know, I, I need to simulate a certain, a certain test condition, in which case we say we do allow for, uh, for waivers. 
uh, saying, well, you know, if you don't, you better have a good reason and put in your waiver ID for something that's been reviewed. Uh, then here, uh, we just had some uh, manager approval guidelines, so the wiki entry for that. And I guess there's, you know, there's three general sections here that are worth pointing out. Up towards the top, they're saying, we don't particularly, uh, you know, recommend an IT, uh, a particular make and model access point. And interestingly enough, we had a fair amount of pushback in the saying, well, how do we know? We know we're not experts. But the other hand, um, you know, you, I think if you do something like this at your company, I think you want to maybe give this some th thought because, you know, on one hand, you know, if you recommend a make and model, it then becomes your problem if it doesn't work for their particular case. But the other hand, you know, I mean, so there can be some back and forth on that. The middle part is just some uh, points about the um, good wireless practices, which they might, the manager might screen out, but you know that's just a kind of advanced warning about some of these things. And then the point at the bottom is probably the thing that would make more of an impression on the manager, saying that uh, uh, you know please know that this you know, a, a, a unauthorized access points are subject to confiscation and nasty and unpleasant emails. And then if they want their access point back, they have to sign a acceptance of manager responsibility letter. And I have a, I have a sample of that uh, a little bit in a future slide here. So then once the manager signs it, then there's some things for the network team to review. And auto channel is one of my annoyances and it seems like that's on a, a lot of the time, and so I actually had a wiki entry about explaining, like, especially why 2.4, why channel three is not a real channel. It's just, <laughs> but uh, uh, so I say, you know, auto channel is turned off. There's also um, just looking at the power and frequency requirements for the particular country, because I should say this is used throughout Intel, you know, the U.S. and uh, all the, you know, throughout the world, Intel's world. And so, it, um, of course, it's not just what's allowed for the country, but we also have some things where we say, uh, uh, maybe there's some major business units that use Wi-Fi and use it for like a factory environment or something. And so you might want to say that the AP, that the powers and channels which are allowed for a system like this would be some subset of what's actually allowed for your country. And uh, of course, I guess another advantage of this is if you have a lot of uh, devices like this, you could, might consider some power and channel coordination. And of course, uh, security patch level for something like crack. So um, if, the, if the process is not approved, you know, or if, if it doesn't go through or it's denied or whatever, then uh, for simpler cases, it's uh, the automation kicks in and uh, the port is shut down. For more complicated cases, we have um, uh, a ticket is generated and manual uh, intervention is needed because if there's multiple MAC addresses on a port, then we have to see, we have to evaluate what it is. I mean, is it something maybe related to you know, a factory or something critical, or maybe we don't want to shut that port down, maybe we want to do something else. Maybe we want to go in there and just plain grab that access point. or. <clears throat> But regardless, um, we do uh, pull out a tracker and see where that device is and identify the culprit of the owner. After that, a severely weirded e email then go out to tell them what they did wrong. Um, this, was a, this was kind of the algorithm, a little bit more detail, but maybe a little bit of an eye chart. But the key, the key thing here was basically in the the, the, the algorithm is that if only one MAC address is detected on the port, then it's done automatically. But if it's more than one MAC address, then um, a, a manual ticket is generated for, um, for the remediation to be done manually. So uh, after the rogue incident, there, um, a manager signs a letter to get the AP returned. Uh, or not, uh, I've had some people who, that uh, a certain portion of the managers where uh, they look at that letter 
and they say, you know, my, my employee, he, uh, he did something, what, I don't think he should get that access point back. And so that happens a certain period of time. So we have a, we have a little collection of access points. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but regardless, you know, the whether they sign the letter or not, the information is um, uploaded into the, uh, to the database of violators, which then uh, can be used to generate different types of actions. Um, of course, repeat, repeat offenders have uh, harsher penalties. Uh, here's actually, so this is what our, uh, this is what I created a while back. And this is the letter of accept, acceptance of manager responsibility. And um, there's just basically a statement saying that uh, we've, we, found, we found an access point that uh, bypassed the process. And that if you want it back, you have to accept responsibility for the security behavior of your direct reports. And uh, that's why when they see this letter, some of the managers say, no, I don't, you know, I'm not interested in, in signing it for my, on behalf of my boat employee. Um, here's a useful feature of one, uh, the system where if you happen to be seeing a list of MAC addresses, um, you can upload a list of, uh, of MAC addresses to see if they already exist in the system. Basically, you could just do like an Excel CSV type file. Um, uh, also, <clears throat> another, op another useful function here is the uh, being able to, uh, if you see a, a, a rogue device pop up, you can search by uh, MAC address or SSID or a substring. So if if I see a rogue device pop up, uh, what I'll do is I'll search on a portion, a portion of that MAC of that SSID, because um, uh, a lot of a lot of the time uh, I'll see a similar SSID in the database, because it might be just that the lab owner forgot to register something or their a new device, uh, and because uh, actually the system tracks things not by SSID but by the sometimes what they've done is oh they. Uh, their access point stopped working, and they um, they got a new one, but uh, they they don't appreciate that the MAC address that, that these devices are tracked by my MAC address. It doesn't matter. So if you buy another device and have it on the same SSID, it doesn't matter because we track things by MAC address. Um, but uh, so they may know somebody who knows somebody, or uh, so it helps in tracking things down. Uh, this, there are some different ways we can look at things here. Uh, one of them had to do with uh, like that building. So when I have a, a wireless uh, uh, problem in a building, one of the things I'll do to qu quickly rule out some of these devices is I'll go and I'll, um, I'll pull up all the uh, access points in a particular building to look to see if that's an issue. And see what, in, compared to the, where the problem is exists. I guess another thing is, but looking, if you keep agreement names consistent, you could pull up all the agreements associated with a business unit because people, they, do, they ask for things like that. But anyway, here's some uh, results from our uh, ticketing system here. And what this does, it uh, looks a little bit like a stock market chart, but uh, you can kind of see a, a downward trend there. So uh, thank you. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you.